Welcome back to the Phil Rosenberg Show. I am your host, Phil Rosenberg, and I am honored this evening because I have one of my favorite guests that I've ever had the pleasure of interviewing, well, more than once. I think we might be up to about a half a dozen times at this point, I'm not sure, but there are very few people I'd rather talk to about what's happening today, what happened yesterday, and what's going to happen tomorrow than Howard Bloom. He's a scientist, he's a teacher, he's a learner, he's a marketing wizard, He's an author. I think of him as an imaginator, one who loves to imagine. It is my pleasure to introduce him. He's the author of Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll. That's his latest of many works, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Recently, there's been a documentary released about Mr. Bloom highlighting several of his contributions entitled The Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom, which premiered not long ago. His career was legendary, but in 1988, Howard fell ill with chronic fatigue syndrome and has been bedridden ever since. Despite his illness, Bloom typed out the scientific theories he'd been thinking about his entire life. So this is called the Grand Unified Theory of Everything in the Universe, including the Human Soul. What does the hypothalamus do? What scientists repress? Masculinity in sexless lizards. The stuff that keeps it all together, the glue is in here. And once I'm gone, that glue is gone. And there's another one in the works, by the way. We'll talk about that. Let's not fail to mention, and in fact, we'll start our interview right here with a brief discussion of the coming Howard Bloom Institute, which is being worked on as we speak by an international body of collaborators. Howard, thank you. Well, it's wonderful to see you. Same, same. So let's start with what I mentioned last, because it's something I don't know much about. Uh, you, there's going to be a Howard Bloom Institute. Do tell. Well, the work that I do um, is aimed at saving somebody, a little kid, um, who is lost and confused um, 350 years from now. And the reason is because when I was 10 years old, I was utterly and completely lost. My parents seemed to not know I existed. And other kids wanted to have nothing to do with me unless they were beating me up or humiliating me. And all of a sudden, a book appeared in my lap in my family's living room in Buffalo, New York, one day, and it said, the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And it gave the example of Galileo, and look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and it gave the example of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, and, and I felt saved. I finally, I had a religion, those first two rules. I, I couldn't hang out with other human beings. I wanted to have nothing to do with me. But Galileo and Anton von Leeuwenhoek had to accept me as a playmate for a simple reason. They were dead and couldn't say no. So in the same way that two guys reached out across a gulf of 350 years and saved me, my task is to reach out of, over a gulf of 350 years and save the next poor, confused kid down the line. So the Howard Bloom Institute is there to perpetuate my work when I'm gone. And by my work, I mean not only my seven books, but I have this little table of contents to my work in the computer. It's titled The Grand Unified Theory of Everything in the Universe, Including Sex, Violence, and the Human Soul. And it has over 10,000 entries, over 10,000 chapters. And those are just references. I mean, this is a 550-page file. But it's only the references to some of the files in the computer. Right now, let me talk about Elon Musk a little. And let's talk about science fiction, what's becoming science fact, uh, exploration of space, human beings throwing themselves out into the far reaches. Uh, these were fantasies at one time. Now they're becoming a reality. So what are the challenges that are left to us? The big main challenges. Oh, they're huge. From existing, for example, as a colony on Mars. What are the big They're huge. I mean, look, we think that we've exhausted the uh, energy or, or the resources on this planet. That's insane. Right now, um, 12 miles beneath your feet and mine, bacteria are busy chewing basalt and turning it and granite and turning it into bio stuff, um, taking dead molecules and snatching them and bringing them into the realm of life, the biosphere. Um, but we are the only species on Earth capable of taking life out of the gravity well. Um, Life has greened and gardened over the last three and a half billion years. A poison pill of stone, a mother of climate catastrophe, this planet. And there are other poison pills of stone above our head, just waiting to be greened and gardened. So that's the vision that I've been pushing. So 
we're talking about human beings leaving the Earth again. How far along do you think we are? How, or, or better asked, how far away are we from establishing a colony even uh, anywhere other than the Earth? We're a lot closer than you would think. Elon Musk's vision is based on developing a new transport system. It's a new rocket called the uh, Starship. That new rocket can carry 100 passengers at a time, plus all of the oxygen, food, and luggage they need um, to survive. Um, Elon plans the, the Starship has had, I've lost track of how many hops it's done so far. Um, I think two or three. But um, it's in rapid development. You could just look up Starship. Um, far, on Google I'll, News. Let me ask you, Howard, how far into space can it get at this point? Well, at this point, it's uh, it's going to do approximately 12 miles. That's not much. And it already did 12 miles and then came back down and landed almost perfectly. Unfortunately, the word is almost because it hit the Earth a little too hard and blew up. But it did something called a belly flop maneuver, which has never been done before, perfectly in space. There was a question about whether that could be done, the edge of space, not really in space. So this thing is getting closer and closer to being ready to go. NASA is talking about getting us to Mars in 2040. Um, that's ridiculous. Elon plans to send his first starship with cargo, not humans, to Mars in 2022. It's now 2021. He's produced so far 12 of these starship prototypes to test. 12. He's mass producing them. So let me mention one thing, or let me ask you, because the history of NASA and its rockets that go into space usually what returns to Earth is just the very tip of the iceberg, so to speak, with the human beings inside of it. The rest of the rocket that left the Earth is dispersed in various different places and not to be used it's again. It's trashed. It's thrown away. It seems, uh, like, seems like a lot of garbage and expensive garbage at that. So I'm wondering, right. how does Elon Musk approach this similar problem of waste? Well, um, What's done by NASA right now, and you've just implied it, is uh, the equivalent of my offering to take you to L.A. So I get together a 737. You can take a bunch of friends to L.A. with you. We fly it out to L.A. Then when we're finished, we fly it over the Pacific and ditch it in the water. That's what. And then I have to buy you a new 747 to get you back. How many tickets to L.A. and back could you afford? Zero. None. That's how NASA does things. It's developing a rocket called the Space Launch System, which will cost $2 billion per flight to fly. And every single one of those highly expensive rockets um, will be thrown away. That's insane. Elon Starship is reusable. What's that gonna do to the price of your getting to space? If Elon plans to launch literally a thousand of these things, that's what he feels he needs to build a city on Mars. That's why his creating a mass production line in Boca Chica and being up to, I think it's actually not just 12 anymore. I think he's got the next three. He's up to 15 in the works. And he says the major trick is learning mass production. Nobody's attempted mass production before um, on vehicles that go to space. Uh, the vehicles that NASA's working on for $2 billion a pop, which is enormous, um, those vehicles will only take three or four astronauts at a time, not a hundred. And then they will be thrown away. Give me a break. Let's enter the 21st century already. But what do we need to do to build a place that human beings can survive on? You know, what kind of, what does a city look like? What kind of materials do we need? What, what's, what's the expectation for what human beings will, will look at when they're standing in a city on Mars? Well, I am on the advisory board of a company called United Space Structures, and it plans to build high rises um, in lava tubes on the moon and on Mars. Um, that's one way to do it. I have to ask, sorry, Howard, what's a lava tube exactly? You mean a like lava a tube. There are these snaking huge caves on Mars and on the moon. At least we think they there are. Um, and uh, they come from volcanic activity, although there is no volcanic activity on the moon. So why there are these tubes up there, God knows. Um, but 
and it's difficult to live on the surface because the radiation is intense. But I really want domes on the surface. I want domes that allow you to see the sky. Um, those lava tubes will have basically um, uh, the kinds of uh, pixels that are on the screens you and I are looking at right now sprayed on the walls um, so that you can have a TV view of a sky, a landscape around you, anything you want. Um, you're right, we need infrastructure, we need construction equipment up there. We need um, what's called ISRU equipment, in situ, whatever it is. It means um, having machinery that will take advantage of the resources that are already there. And there's lots of ice on both the moon and Mars. Ice is water. Um, mine that, break it down, and you get breathable air, you get drinkable water, and you get the gold of space, rocket fuel. If it were possible tomorrow for us to establish a colony on Mars, would you be on the first ship if you were given a choice to settle I've that? never been interested in going to space. I, I love thinking about space. I love conceptualizing about space. I know that the mission of life is to garden the solar system, green the galaxy. By the way, if you go to howardbloom.net, you can find my 100 picture visual manifesto for the future of life and the future of humanity called Garden the Solar System, Green the Galaxy. And that's the vision. So my imagination does just fine um, with knowing that space is there and giving a, getting an idea of the things that we can do up there. But going there, it's not really what I want to do in life. Got you. All right, let's uh, turn the page here. I want to talk a little bit about your latest book, um, I have been a fan of Michael Jackson ever since I was a lad. I mean, oh, that's really... a blessing! Thank goodness. <laughs> so, in, introduce me. Give us. It's got. A, it's it's a huge name, and it's about a lot of things, and it's about a lot more than what you would guess by just the cover of the book. It's about a quest for the ecstatic experience. It's about a quest for the uh, the ecstasies of spirit. It's about a quest for those things that make us feel as if we are caught up in something bigger than ourselves that exhilarate us, that exalt us. In a sense, it's a quest for divinity from an atheist who believes that divinity is a personal experience or a group experience, not uh, a God, not a deity. If there is a deity, that deity is us in the process of trying to become the gods that we imagine. It's been named uh, the best book of 2020 by the New York uh, Weekly Times and the LA Weekly Times, and it's been named 2020's most uh, spiritual book on planet Earth um, by, I forget the name of the publication. So, it, it, but it's an adventure. It's an adventure taking a deep dive into the souls of some of the most important people in, in pop culture of the 1970s and 1980s. So let me ask you a question. I would like to talk a little bit about Michael Jackson. Um, you're one of the people who knew him pretty well. And I think you can answer some questions that are a little bit controversial. People want to know. Right. So first, let me ask you, so how well did you know Michael Jackson? I felt I knew him intimately. So people think about the, his ranch called Neverland and his uh, association with children. And there's been a lot of, well, at least innuendo, sometimes outright discussion of pedophilia and nothing has ever been proved in a court of law but you knew michael jackson really well so in your estimation is something like that did, did it happen or is it just the fantasy of jealous people well first of all michael was the closest to a saint closest to divinity that i have ever met on earth he was so far beyond the, the norm uh in his capacity for wonder his capacity for awe his capacity for surprise his commitment to truth and his commitment to what he saw as his kids, which was absolute. Um, I, I loved him the minute I met him, and I didn't expect Bill to love him. Um, so it's hard for me to believe these ideas of pedophilia. And, and the film that came out of two years ago, roughly, on Michael, made with uh, two guys who claimed that they had been abused by Michael. To me, they sounded highly credible. But a bunch of Michael Jackson fans went after them and went over their claims 
and and it saw whether they could possibly exist in the timeline of Michael Jackson's life, which these fans are so dedicated to that they know every inch of. And these things simply didn't fit. But frankly, I don't want those things to be true, so I'm biased. Um, but it seems to me that these things would have been nigh unto impossible. And Michael loved his kids because, look, you take a bunch of baby rats, and baby rats need a play for a certain amount of time in their childhood. You isolate those rats so they can't play during that critical play period, and then you put them back with other rats. Guess what they do as adults? They do the same amount of playing they would have done if they were children. In other words, they're suffering from play deprivation. Michael suffered from childhood deprivation because he was a professional from the time he was six. He never had an opportunity to experience a childhood. So children mean everything in the world to him. He felt God had given him a gift of these astonishing abilities to see the infinite in the tiniest of things. And it was his job to give that gift to his kids. I know you have a page on Amazon and everyone can pick up not just this book about Michael Jackson, but all of your works. Is there right. any place else that folks can look besides Howard Bloom at Amazon.com to if they're interested in reading more? Because you have let's and let's list a few of the options that folks will have, by the way. Well, uh, HowardBloom.net and there's a page on HowardBloom.net that tells you how all the seven books fit together, um, because they're all about mass behavior. Um, they're about the mass behavior from quarks to human beings. Um, they're about everything from the origin of the first material things to what in the hell is soul. Because um, those things all fit on a timeline of the cosmos. There's co The cosmos has given birth to the human spirit. The cosmos has given birth to the secular vision of soul um, that I've been after all my life. Um, and if the cosmos has given birth to it, then how do we explain how those possibilities were implicit in the, in the precipitation of the very first things in the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago? And these books are a pursuit, an integrated pursuit of that question. So one is not enough in short. Um, well, I hope one is not enough. Buy them all, trade them, get the whole set. All right. So, Howard, I want to thank you very much. We're about out of time this evening. As always, it is an extreme pleasure to have a chat with you, and I have learned a bunch. Thank you and very much for joining me tonight. And it's always an extreme pleasure for me to be with you. Hi, this is Phil of the Phil Rosenberg Show, and I'm here to ask you to do me a small favor. Just take your finger, reach out, click the button that says subscribe. Just take your finger, reach out and click the button that says subscribe. I need a bunch of subscribers and the more subscribers I have, something good happens. I don't even know what that is. They tell me I gotta have more subscribers. I believe them. So please do that for me, I'd appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, enjoy the show.